I'm investigating the disappearance of 12-year-old Tia Sharp, who went missing in New Addington around midday on Friday. It goes without saying, this is an absolutely terrible time for Tia's family, who are all desperate for her to be found safe and well. Uh, I cannot imagine how it must feel for this family after more than five days. There are over 80 officers working on this case, 40 of them detectives, 40 of them specialist search officers. We are doing everything we can, everything we possibly can to find her. Our appeal was for anyone who may have seen her or who has information about her to come forward. The cold-blooded murder of a child is always particularly disturbing. But this notorious case from the UK has a horror all its own. The disappearance of 12-year-old Tia Sharp from her grandparents' South London home was suspicious from the start. The entire country rallied together in the search for the missing schoolgirl. But it wouldn't be until the odor of a decomposing body had permeated the entire crime scene that police would finally lock on. Tia's body was just several feet away, where it had been the entire time, just like her killer. Welcome to Fear Files, where we discuss and dissect the most mysterious, terrifying, and mind-bending cases from all over the world. Before we start, we would like to send our thoughts and prayers to the loved ones of Tia Sharp, who fell victim to the abominable act of this deranged man. Before we dive in, we'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Best Fiends, who made today's Fear Files video possible. Here at Fear Files, plumbing the depths of the most depraved minds on the planet 24-7 can sometimes get a little intense, which is why we like to mix things up throughout the day with some regular and competitive rounds of Best Fiends. It's got all the fun of a match three game just with better visuals, more challenges, and a more creative storyline. The goal of the game is to collect as many insect pals, called fiends, as you can, and there are thousands of puzzles to solve. The catch? You're working against a swarm of invading slugs. Defeating slugs and collecting cute new pals is a super relaxing pick-me-up, and a great way to prove to your workmates just how much smarter than them you really are. So if you haven't had a chance to check out this 5-star app, well, check it out. Download Best Fiends today for free using our link below and you'll get five dollars worth of gold and energy for free if you beat level five. And remember it's just like friends but without the R. Best Fiends. Welcome to New Addington, South London. In the 1930s, London town planners had a vision for New Addington as the next great garden city offering residents the best of city and rural living. That vision didn't quite come off. By 2012, New Addington was better known as the next great hotspot for gang violence, drugs, and unemployment. But for all its problems, the one thing New Addington always had is a strong sense of community. And that sense of community was sorely needed in August of 2012, when the unthinkable happened. New Addington had a special significance for 12-year-old Tia Sharp, a funny, cheeky, confident girl who had just finished her first year of secondary school. Tia had been born in New Addington, in the very home where her grandmother, 47-year-old Christine Bicknell, still lived. Her mom, Natalie, had been just 18 when Tia was born. She'd split from Tia's dad some months earlier, but Natalie couldn't have been happier to have baby Tia to dote on. And with the support of her mother, Christine, Tia was set to grow up in a tight-knit family where the three women would come to think of each other more as best friends than relatives. By the time she was 12, Tia had a loving stepfather in David Niles and two half-brothers, three-year-old Jack and one-year-old Harry. Life hadn't always been smooth sailing for Tia, but nobody's is. Contact with her dad, Stephen Carter, had been sporadic. There had been some issues with social services about her poor school attendance as well as her parents' cannabis use, but Tia had always gotten good grades, and by the time she reached secondary school, Tia was a confident, sparky, happy-go-lucky girl. 
In fact, while she was just four feet five inches tall, Tia was a firecracker, her mom said, the loudest person in the room who befriended everyone and always spoke her mind. She would front up to bullies to defend her friends. She also loved performing and would sing into her Blackberry, often while watching her favorite show, The X Factor. Her grandmother's house in New Addington was like a second home. With the two small brothers, her own house could be quite crowded and noisy. With only two bedrooms, she slept on the couch. At her grandmother's, she had a whole room to herself. She also idolized the man that she called Granddad, 37-year-old Stuart Hazel. In August 2012, Tia was midway through her summer vacation and was keen for a spell at her grandparents'. Tia asked her grandmother if she could stay a few nights. Christine agreed, but she would need to check with Stuart. She was doing a night shift at a care home that night. Later that day, a message pinged on Natalie's phone. Stuart was more than happy to take Tia. Stuart was one of Tia's favorite people on the planet. Over the years, he'd babysat her even more than her grandmother and was like a big kid himself. He also was a soft touch and would let her stay up late gaming and watching movies. Everyone knew Stuart Hazel had his run-ins with the law, including three stints in jail. But throughout the many years the Sharps had known him, he had been nothing but good to Christine. Ten years her junior, he had once dated her daughter Natalie, but that had been a long time before they'd gotten together. He still drank too much and had a daily marijuana habit, but so long as he stayed away from vodka, they hardly had a rocky moment. He also didn't have much interest in sex, Christine said, but other than that, Stuart was everything she needed. The couple had had one big setback, though, in 2010, when Stuart had been jailed for 12 months. He had been thrown out of a nearby pub after becoming aggressive. A few minutes later, the landlord had spied him, heading back towards the pub, this time brandishing a machete. He locked the door and called the police. Christine stood by him. What went on outside her home was not her concern. On August 2nd, Stuart Hazel met Tia at the railway station in Croydon. CCTV footage captures them on the tram and then shopping in New Addington. There, they bought pizza, oven chips, iced lollies, and Tia's favorite, sausage rolls. Tia appeared relaxed and happy. That night, Christine rang Stuart to check on how things were going. She heard Tia's belly laugh in the background. At 10.12 p.m., Stuart messaged Christine saying, Tia's going to bed after Family Guy, baby, and then I'm going to pass out. He sent another message at 11.33, which said, Night, night, baby. Call you tomorrow, XXX. The last message sent from Tia's Blackberry was to a friend at 12.42 a.m. When Christine returned home from her night shift the following morning, she found Stuart alone on the couch watching TV. Hazel told her that Tia had left to go shopping in Croydon. She wanted new flip-flops and had promised to be back by 6 p.m. 6 p.m. came and went. Christine started to panic. Tia had left her phone on charge and hadn't even taken her travel card. Natalie hadn't seen her either. She and Hazel took the car and drove the streets looking for her. No one had seen or heard from her all day. At 10 p.m., they reported Tia missing to the police. Stewart told officers that he got up that morning, drunk coffee, and tidied up the house, fed the dogs, and smoked cigarettes. Tia had got up late and came downstairs, he said, and he made her some breakfast. She mentioned going to Croydon and meeting a friend, he didn't know who, and then she walked out the door. One look at Stuart Hazel would rouse anyone's suspicions, though. He was only 37, but he looked like someone you would see in a poster warning kids away from drug abuse, and with his mile-long rap sheet of convictions, he was the last human being most people would entrust with their children, let alone open their doors to. A search was conducted of the new Addington house, which produced nothing, but then Stuart's fuzzy account of Tia walking out the door with no phone was suddenly corroborated by a neighbor. Paul Meehan claimed to have seen Tia leave the house that day at exactly the time Stuart had specified, around 12.10 p.m. Police now focused their attention on the realistic possibility that Tia had actually walked to the tram stop and had gone to Croydon. One of the most publicized search campaigns in British history was launched on August the 4th. 
The news of the missing 12-year-old from New Addington was headline news. The Sun offered a reward of 25,000 pounds for any information that might help find Tia. Within hours, t-shirts had been printed with Tia's face on it and the entire New Addington community were handing out flyers and combing the streets and nearby woodland. Tia's father, Stephen Carter, came down from Northampton. Stuart Hazel was one of those leading the search. Natalie's brother had become the unofficial spokesperson for the Sharps and led media interviews and press conferences. Everyone was adamant that Tia had not run away nor would she have willingly gone off with a stranger. Her grandmother, Christine, had lectured her repeatedly on stranger danger. Another search of Christine's house was conducted, this time with a sniffer dog. Nothing of interest was found. 800 hours of CCTV footage was trawled through with no sign of Tia at the tram stop, on the tram, or anywhere else. It was like she'd walked out the door and fallen into a hole, Natalie said. 55 sightings of Tia on the day of her disappearance were also exhaustively investigated, but all led nowhere. On Monday, August the 6th, the family made an emotional plea for information on Tia's disappearance. Meanwhile, Hazel's dad had contradicted Stewart's account. Stewart had told him that he had walked Tia to the tram stop. It was just one of many inconsistencies in what was becoming an evolving story. Reporters had descended upon the Addington house from the first day the news broke, and in particular, the spotlight was on Stuart Hazel. He was known to be the last person to see Tia alive. With the house surrounded by media and the police repeatedly turning up on the doorstep, Stuart was feeling heat from all sides. Everyone seemed to think that he knew more than he was letting on. Soon, he couldn't leave the house without being ambushed. The police searched the house for the third time with dogs, again to no avail. Six days had passed, and with each new day, hope was turning into a hellish and empty kind of despair. On August 9th, Stuart Hazel had enough of the speculation. He requested an interview with ITV and within hours was sitting in the lounge room of his Addington home with a former detective and an ITV journalist ready to defend his reputation to the nation. The interview was not well received. The consensus was that Stewart was shifty and skittish and acted like a truly guilty man. Body language experts weighed in with their analysis. Stewart's earlobes had turned red when he was probed about Tia, a sign of an increase in blood pressure, itself a symptom of stress or fear. He had blinked excessively, also a sign of anxiety. And while he'd been clear on his own movements, he was fuzzy on everything Tia had done or said that morning. The Sharp family rallied around Stuart. Christine assured Stuart that she had his back. She'd been leaning on Hazel for support from the moment Tia had disappeared. Night after night, he'd held her and comfort her in the bed that they shared. Those moments would soon haunt her like a nightmare she'd never wake up from. Christine didn't know it yet but she was sleeping several feet below the decomposing body of her beloved granddaughter, and the child's killer was lying right beside her. Stuart Hazel was a deeply sick and warped individual. Christine had thought she knew everything about Stuart Hazel. In reality, she knew very little. His inner world was straight from hell itself, a world fueled by obsessive fantasies about the violent and sexual abuse of children. Stuart himself had been born into dysfunction. His mother was a prostitute, his father a career criminal. He had been put into care at a young age. Later, his mother and sister would describe him as creepy, untrustworthy, and someone who would steal anything that wasn't nailed down. His mother seemed unable to connect the dots between the child's environment and their behavior. By the age of 12, Stewart was on the fast track towards addiction and delinquency. He joined a South London gang of crack cocaine dealers and began accumulating a long list of convictions, including grievous bodily harm, assault, theft, and burglary. He was also volatile and prone to self-harming and depression. People described him as a fantasist and a pathological liar. He told one boss that his dad had died in order to get extra time off. His performance, breaking down in floods of tears, was chillingly convincing. 
But the most depraved side of Stuart hadn't even shown itself yet. It's likely Stuart had a sexual interest in children long before 2005, but it was around this time that he began to actively indulge his interest in child abuse pornography. It would fast become an addiction that would dominate most of his spare time. In 2010, the focus of his sick fantasies shifted to his step-granddaughter, Tia, then 10 years old. He tailored his searches using keywords like dark-haired girl with glasses and incest. With Tia, a regular overnight guest at his house, Stewart then made the step from fantasist to voyeur. He had tampered with a light fitting in Tia's bedroom to create a spy hole and covertly filmed her naked, putting lotion on her legs. At one point, he removed the bathroom door under the guise of needing to paint and repair it. By 2012, he was creeping into Tia's room and filming her as she slept. Nick Scola, Detective Chief Inspector, said that by now, Stewart had convinced himself that Tia loved him. By August of 2012, Hazel's warped fascination with Tia had become an obsession. He spent hours each day watching child abuse pornography on his mobile phone, and the impulse to act on his fantasy was building to the point where it would soon become impossible to resist. Maybe he never intended to resist it at all. On Friday, August the 10th, Christine woke again to a foul smell she had caught wafts of for days, only now it was much stronger. It was like the smell of a dead rat or a rug that a cat had been using to pee on, but she couldn't locate the source of the smell. Hazel had left the house early that morning. He'd left a note saying he'd popped out for a newspaper and would be back soon. Police arrived later that day, this time for a fourth search of the house. Christine warned them of the smell. She didn't need to. They recognized it immediately. It was the smell of death and decomposition. Officers cleared the house immediately. Within 10 minutes of searching the loft, they had located the body of 12-year-old Tia Sharp. Her naked body had been wrapped in garbage bags and sheets and placed under bags and debris between the loft rafters. A week in the heat and humidity of the loft had caused her body to decompose to the point that she was unrecognizable. Her cause of death was impossible to identify. The discovery that Tia's body had been in the house the whole time was almost too horrific for the Sharp family to comprehend. So was the notion that Stuart, the man they'd loved and trusted all those years, could be the monster behind this act. Alongside Tia's body, police found a bag of Tia's clothes and Hazel's broken glasses. Memory cards from Hazel's digital camera were found shoved into a doorframe. The images on these cards would reveal the full depths of Hazel's depravity. Later, police would apologize to Tia's family for having missed Tia's body during three previous searches. Human error and an inexperienced detective were blamed for the oversight. It seemed they'd never really searched the loft, even when the sniffer dog had alerted them to the ceiling. As it turned out, they'd also never put Stuart Hazel under police surveillance. At any moment, he could just up and leave, and it seemed that he had. When a rolling drunk Stuart Hazel stumbled into a shop just a few train stops from New Addington, 11-year-old Chloe Bird had just seen the report on the news. Shaking, she left the shop and went home to tell her parents, who called the police. Several other people spotted Hazel that day before he wandered off into the Cannon Hill Common, Morden. A police helicopter using a thermal imaging camera pinpointed Hazel soon afterwards. He had covered himself in a blanket and hidden under a log. Stuart Hazel was arrested around 9 p.m. on August the 10th. Around a hundred onlookers shouted, cursed, and kicked at the police van as it drove away. I prayed that one of them got their hands on him before the police did, Natalie Sharp said. Soon after the discovery of Tia's body, Floral tributes began being left at a makeshift shrine near Christine's house. Within hours, it had grown to a vast tribute of candles, cards, teddies, and flowers, a community's cry of anguish for the young girl who had lost her life in such a horrific way. On May 7, 2013, Stuart Hazel pled not guilty to the charge of murdering Tia Sharp. 
He claimed that he and Tia had been playing together when Tia had fallen down the stairs. He passed out drunk and had woken to find Tia dead on the floor and panicked. For four grueling days, the Sharp family had to endure hearing the graphic details of the forensic findings in the house, including the blood and semen found on Tia's bedding and his belt, and the images found on Hazel's camera. Prosecutors theorized that Hazel had gotten drunk that night before attempting to assault Tia sometime after 12.45 p.m. Tia had most likely resisted the assault. Hazel's broken glasses had her fingerprints on them. Hazel smothered Tia to prevent her telling anyone what he'd done. But Hazel's violation of Tia was nowhere near over. A photo found on Hazel's phone taken around 6.30 a.m., showed Tia placed in a sexual pose on her bed. There were bloodstains on the sheets. But the dappling of her skin suggests that, by this time, Tia had already been dead for several hours. Hazel had spent hours with Tia's body and placed her body in that pose. Stewart kept this one image on his phone, a sickening keepsake and trophy. During the days in which the world searched for his missing granddaughter, Hazel repeatedly looked at the image and trawled the internet for incest websites. On the fifth day of his trial, Stuart Hazel changed his plea to guilty. He was sentenced to life imprisonment with the first possibility of parole in 38 years. His neighbor, Paul Meehan, who had falsely claimed to have seen Tia, was found guilty of wasting police time and was sentenced to five months in prison. Now, for nine months, Stuart Hazel insisted Tia Sharp died after falling downstairs. Today, he finally pleaded guilty to murdering her. But the dramatic turnaround came simply too late to prevent Tia's family enduring four days of harrowing evidence. The South London schoolgirl's body was found hidden in the house of her grandmother, Hazel's former partner, last summer. And just to warn you, some of you may find the detail in Jane Deeth's report upsetting. So what can you tell me about the murder of Tia Sharp, Stuart? He told them nothing. Oh, a couple of minutes, you must listen, please. But today, Stuart Hazel finally admitted a sexual and sadistic murder of a 12-year-old girl who trusted and idolised him. Tia Sharp's family thought Hazel loved her like a granddaughter. But one night in the summer holidays, when he was looking after Tia, he assaulted her and then, it's believed, smothered her. On trial, he claimed she died after falling down the stairs, until today, when his legal team asked for the charge of murder to be put to him again. He paused and then said guilty. It was the one true word he's spoken since he murdered Tia Sharp. Apparently, he felt her family had suffered enough. Or did he just realise the evidence against him was too strong? Tia Sharp's family, her mother, Natalie, and grandmother Christine Bicknell, Hazel's former partner, had to endure that appalling evidence. Videos Hazel had taken of Tia Sharp when she was sleeping, the sex toy with her blood on it, the indecent photograph he took of her after he'd killed her, the searches for child pornography and incest on his mobile phone. Tia Sharp's father said hearing what Hazel did to his daughter shattered his heart. Hazel will be sentenced tomorrow. In my opinion, it will not be enough. He should serve his time, then be hung. The police say Stuart Hazel must be removed from society. Hazel is a violent and dangerous man who poses a significant risk to young girls. Yeah. It's only proper he will receive a long prison sentence. He lied to his partner, Christine Bicknell telling her her granddaughter had gone shopping for sandals and not come home. He lied to the police, playing the grieving granddad, desperate to find Tia. He sat on the sofa while Tia's body was in the loft and lied. I know deep down in my heart that Tia walked out of my house. She walked out there and I know damn well because she was seen walking down the pathway. I know she made that track down to that way. What happened after that is I don't know. For eight days, he had everyone believing Tia Sharp was missing. The police searched the loft twice, but...
but failed to find her. The media outside Stuart Hazel's front door meant he couldn't move the body. After a week, the smell led to Tia's discovery and Hazel was arrested. People on the estate knew him as a nasty, violent man. He'd been to prison for dealing cocaine and possessing a blade. In fact, it was a machete. In a court statement, Tia's mother, Natalie Sharp, described wanting to hurt Stuart Hazel. Except, she said, I could never manage to hurt him like he's hurt me. In November 2013, the search engine companies, including Google and Microsoft, relented to public pressure and took measures to prevent users from finding child abuse images online. The tragedy of Tia Sharp was regularly cited in this campaign to force through the change. But for the Sharp family, the pain and horror over Tia's murder will endure a lifetime. Every breath I take is like a breath of hell, Natalie Sharp said. There is no release. There's no relent. There's nothing. If you found this case compelling, don't forget to like the video, comment down below your take on it, and subscribe to the channel. Also, hit that notification bell in order to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadows. This video is sponsored by Best Fiends. Download Best Fiends for free at download.bestfiends.com and get $5 worth of gold and energy for free if you beat level 5.